Welcome to Ask the Mayor with D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser with NBC4 reporter Tom Sherwood. Here's your host, Bruce Allen. And good morning. Glad to have Tom here. Mayor Bowser, glad to have you here, Thank too. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks for being here. Six months in? Six months. How does the job differ from where you thought it was going to be, and how do you think you're doing? Well, we are having a great six months. We built a great team. Um, uh, we have been very successful in enacting a good part of our agenda in the first six months. Uh, and more than that, uh, as I get around the city, across all eight wards, as I get into talking to different stakeholder groups, people really do feel a new energy um, at the, the top of our government. Uh, they feel like we have a fresh start. How about and that's the relationship exactly with council well, members? Well, wait, wait, wait we, we ought to, <laughs> that's, that'll take more time. Let me, can, <laughs> let me follow, follow up with that. How are you doing personally? This is, this Everyone wants to, who wants to be mayor, people do get in and they realize this is a draining job. It takes a lot of time. How are you doing personally in terms of getting rest, scheduling your week? To well, the thanks for being concerned about I'm worried, me, Tom. I'm worried but about I, I got to tell people. you, you seem surprised. I, I have uh, the 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 best job in the world. I get to be mayor of my hometown. Uh, I was a council member for eight years, so, um, almost eight years. So I could uh, really see what we needed to do differently uh, in in our government. What we heard from people is that this is a city that's moving in the right direction in a lot of ways, uh, but the government had to be more intentional and focused on spreading that prosperity for more Washington. But that, that's the government. I'm talking about you personally. Do you get enough sleep? Do you feel like you're just, you get hundreds of probably invitations a week? Yes. I, mean, I don't think some people don't realize the intensity of the job that you, you have to look at smooth it's, now. Sure. It's an intense job, but um, it's it's one that, that I love and I have a great team to help me. Uh, so we have a, a, a government of 30,000 people. I've been very lucky that we've cr uh, recruited um, the best leaders at the top from the city administrator to great agency heads, um, to people on the front lines who are helping me. And I have practice uh, okay. in making sure I have people should know. And sometimes my constituents, like you, ask me, do you have balance? And right. balance. Uh, that's, that's important. Uh, so I, I make sure I get one day off a week. And you exercise. I exercise. Tom is really concerned about it. He you. is. I'm, I'm the biggest thing, the hardest part I will tell you is um, eating well because you're you're out all of the time. I often leave at 9, come home at 10 at night. And so all that time, the average person gets to eat at least one meal at home. I don't always have that opportunity. And that banquet food can t be terrible for it you. It is bad. <laughs> all right, but let's, but having, yeah. having been a council member, though, you know how the council feels in certain situations. Yes. How do you characterize your relationship with council members? It's good. You know, I was on the council. I regard the the council certainly as a, a equal branch of our government that has a huge responsibility. Uh, we have a, a system of government where 14 people are generally responsible for a $13 billion budget, um, creating that budget, executing that budget, and overseeing how, how those funds um, are used. It is different, however, uh, being on, on this side uh, and making sure we maintain those relationships. So I get to meet with the, the chairman of the council um, every week. I've forged a very good relationship. I, I talked in my state of the district address about a group of new council members. I called them the new kids on the block. Uh, <laughs> now they've been joined by two new council members. So five, fully five out of the 13 members of the council um, are new to the process. They have great energy and ideas and experience. So they come to the council um, ready to get to work. Want to ask you about a very important meeting you have coming up later today. We'll do that right after we break here for traffic and weather together on the 8th. And we are back with Ask the Mayor with D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser. We are with NBC4 reporter Tom Sherwood today. Tom, take it away. Mayor, we were talking about the council and your relationship. You were on the council. You know there are there are 13 personalities yes. there, and you have to deal with all 13. Sometimes yes. people say it's like herding cats. Uh, but some people have said, that, wow, you've done a very good job of establishing your yourself as mayor, gr grabbing the reins of government. Thank you. I said some people say that. A lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, a lot of people do say that. But there's also, I've heard that, the, the relationship with the council is pretty tense with the chairman. You do meet once a week, and several of the council members have privately said that you are a little thin-skinned sometimes dealing with them when you don't get your way, but you get your way 98% of the time. And what, how would you respond to that? 
Well, I, I do. Listen, I was elected because people agree with the vision and the agenda that we have for the city. I can't tell you how often people tell me, keep fighting to make sure that we're creating and preserving pathways to the middle class in the District of Columbia. So that's my job. Uh, and uh, I get elected to fight for it. And sometimes it can be tense. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we are all elected uh, to make sure we're executing um, the will of the people. So I think sometimes people are are surprised that I fight so hard for the things that I believe in. Um, but that, that, that's exactly my job. It's not personal. Uh, it's the jobs that, that we were elected to do. And that's what I, that's what I go down. Mayor there Barry called said, it's not personal with politics. It's public policy. It's public policy and it's governing. Um, and the thing about governing in a democracy, uh, everybody fights till the end, but at the end of the day, we're all professionals. Um, and, uh, we're all elected to serve the will of the people. Uh, so I, I have served, uh, I served uh, with two mayors uh, and every relationship between the council and the mayor is characterized by wins and losses. You win some, uh, you lose some. Uh, now, some say that I got 98 percent of what I wanted in the budget. Um, and so if you I'm not the mayor that's going to be satisfied with not getting that two percent. Uh, so we're going to figure out how, how to get it next. So what was important in that budget is that we got one hundred million dollars, like I promised, uh, in affordable housing for the Housing Production Trust Fund. Uh, we made sure sure uh, also that we were putting a down payment on ending homelessness in the District of Columbia. No matter where people live in our city, they're concerned that we are doing better to make sure families are safe and secure uh, and not on our streets or in dangerous shelters. We also did more for our kids to make sure they were getting to school um, and uh, in having a free ride. Uh, which That's on Metro. No, is metro <laughs> that's on us. And no, but I mean the, the free ride to Metro. Absolutely. Right? Metro so, is not working. That's why you're having the meeting this afternoon with Andrew Fox, Anthony Fox. Well, Metro, like, like many of us, just like all of us, when we hit middle age, we need more investment. Uh, we need more care and we need a a, a, a sense of direction that's more urgent. Um, and that's what our transit authority at, at needs. At 2 o'clock today, you'll be meeting with Secretary Fox, yes. Governor McAuliffe of Virginia, and Boyd Maryland Rutherford, Lieutenant the Lieutenant right. Governor Boyd Rutherford, because Governor Hogan can't be there. Fox, the secretary, has said this region has got to do more to find a good quality leader of Metro and improve safety, reliability, efficiency, all the things. Like Metro needs a total reworking of its job. Wow, that sounds and like been, what I said three months been, ago. I know, I'm going to say you've been leading that, but, yes. but the Metro's had a hard time deciding how it's going to look for a new general manager. They're just pretty much starting. What can this meeting do today to reassure commuters that something's going to be done to get Metro on the right track? Well, l let me start by saying these conversations have been ongoing for many months, uh, among not only among the regional leaders, but uh, among the, the states as well. So I really look forward to the opportunity uh, to sit down uh, with the governors and the secretary. I've had the opportunity already to have a sit down with the secretary and the, the FTA administrator to, to talk about Metro. That's the Federal Transit Administration. The Federal Transit administration. So we've we've had uh, these meetings separately, uh, and we've also pushed our board members. I appointed two new board members at the beginning of the year, uh, one especially that has a lot of board experience and a lot of experience uh, with, with helping aid, uh, agencies or organizations that are having a tough time and turning them around. The union doesn't what has, like him. Well, the well, transit they, union was furious at you for appointing his name. I'm sorry. His name is Corbett Price. Price, and I think you you will notice that um, at his most recent confirmation hearing, he sailed through um, because he has demonstrated that he has the the skills and the experience um, to help move the board along. What has been the holdup in forming the Metro Safety Commission, which is an oversight committee required by federal law? Well, I think that we are waiting for some rulemaking from the feds, and that will be um, one part of our conversation uh, to make sure that anything that the federal government can do. Let's keep in mind, this is our, our subway system, right? It's our transit system, but it's also America's transit system. Um, uh, the Metro WMATA's system carries 
uh, so many federal workers that are taking them from their homes to federal jobs and millions of people from around our country and the world who come to visit the District of Columbia. Um, so the federal government has a unique um, responsibility and interest in investing uh, in our metro system. Um, so we want to we want to make sure uh, not only that uh, the transportation secretary, who, by the way, uh, knows a lot about our system. Um, he knows about uh, the impacts of public transit on cities, and he, I expect him to be a great partner. Now, he he has some expectations of us, too, um, which we he, have a big authority. He called meeting, right? Uh, he, yes, he called. Uh, he asked us all to, to come in to talk about um, some next uh, big steps um, for the metro system. So uh, we want to make sure that the authority is being accountable, that it's getting its payments on track with the federal government. We want to make sure if there's any rulemaking that's needed to come from the FTA that, that we get that going. Um, and we also want uh, the administration, and we want to, we're very thankful to President Obama to keep pushing for the $150 million that the president put in his budget as part of um, our capital funding, which was threatened by the Congress, but I think we have it back up to 150 it, 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 The problem with the, with the federal government is that it's a partner. It has, I think, four seats on the Metro board, which is an unwieldy board to begin with. It's a three billion dollar metro budget, and the and the feds put in one hundred and fifty million dollars. And only in government can you say that's a drop in the bucket. Do you think this is a chance for you to talk to the secretary about how you know sometimes seventy percent of the rush hour traffic is made up of federal workers? Why isn't the federal government stepping in rather than just criticizing what the city and the metro has done? Why isn't it? Anteing up. Well, I think there is an opportunity to talk about the long-term capital needs. We have certain things that we need to keep Metro in a state of good repair, um, but it won't be in a state of good repair for long because of the growth of this region. Um, so we always have to talk about growing Metro, and that's what the momentum plan is about. But I think first things first, uh, we want to make sure that we demonstrate uh, financial accountability, that we have strong forward-looking leadership. I was pleased uh, that the board recently opened up the general manager search, but also opened up the type of person that they could be looking for. Somebody who has a demonstrated financial background or transit background or turning an organization around. Any one of those people uh, could be considered. The big thing is that you have to have somebody coming in there with a bold vision um, that's willing to implement uh, the change needed urgently. By well, the so end of this year? Do you think we'll have a, a general manager in place by the end of this year? I don't see why not. I mean, I think that would be very important. They've started the search. They're going to throw it out. They have a – the board has a um – you know, a schedule of how they will interview candidates. I think what's important is that they have the, the right leader. Well, they, had start, they had started it before, but then stopped it, and the candidates withdrew their names, and then it took a while to restart it. What was the problem there? I think the discussion was what type of recruitment they they would start, um, and I think they're on the right on the right track now. All right. We have to take a break for traffic and weather. We'll be back with more with Mayor Muriel Bowser. <laughs> And we are back with Ask the Mayor here on WTOP. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser is with us, along with NBC4 reporter Tom Sherwood. I'm Bruce Allen. Tom, your turn here. Mayor Jim Deniger of the Board of Trade has said that Metro is the fundamental block of development for the entire region. We've got to 6 million people, and it's got to work well. But I want to go switch to traffic, something this station pays a lot of attention to. I've had, I, in recent days, weeks, I have driven out New York Avenue, Mass Avenue, Southeast Southwest Freeway during the evening rush hour, 19th Street, L Street, um, Benning Road, all these places. They are packed. They are moving. And I'm just wondering, I, I don't see traffic control aids. I don't see police officers directing traffic. It just seems to me that we're a victim of our own success in the city. We're growing so well. People are living here, working here now. You can't get to the—you talked about the pathways to the middle class. If you can't get to the job, it doesn't matter whether you have one or not. Is there anything you can say about the traffic conditions in the city? 
Yes. Um, it, it takes a long time to get places, yeah. and we all know that. <laughs> we all don't and, have sirens like you do. I know you don't like to use it. But, no, uh, I don't. And so uh, one thing, and sometimes people chuckle when I say this, um, but I've said, I, I think I even said in my state of the district that part of our job is to, to make the, the roadways um, more, you know, the traffic lights on our roadways synchronized better. And already in our first six, mo six months, our DDOT has experimented on various corridors to better synchronize the lights. And anecdotally, people are, are telling us they're saving many minutes on, uh, on their commutes to work. But what you point to is this. We won't be, we're a city where we're not going to build uh, new roadways. Um, so we have to, we have to look at our roadway capacity, make it work better with better synchronization. Uh, we're looking at things to have our buses move better on our roadways uh, as well. But it points to directly making making sure that our all modes are operating more efficiently. Bikes. Bikes, bus, walk, um, all of those things. But none of it will work if we don't have a metro system that's that's reliable. Um, but I, in that, in talking about public transit, uh, among our successes are being able to attract people to the bus. And uh, that's going to get a lot of our attention. When you look uh, down uh, 16th Street, for example, we're looking at ways to better move buses. People love so, those buses. 16th Street. 16th. Yes. So we have express bus service on many corridors, 16th Street, Georgia Avenue, other corridors throughout the city. Um, but the buses are getting caught up in the same traffic. So how can we get those buses through the traffic? Uh, what I've learned is that people will take public transportation if it's convenient, um, if it's cost effective, and if it's comfortable. Um, and we're actually um, getting to all those places. Now we have to move it through traffic. Yeah. And other cities have very big express bus systems. Yes. It just hasn't caught on that big around here. Yes. Yeah, so we, we think that we will um, certainly be able to, to get some dedicated bus on the road soon. Good. Might require well, dedicated lanes, too. By dedicate, that's what I mean. I didn't hear the word lane. streetcar, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> but 8th Street, I know D Director Dormjo, DDOT, has said we're not going to give a date for starting because we just got too much to do to fix the system right. before we open it. But. Your, I think in your inaugural address, you said the streetcar. You did believe in the streetcar. What is your your vision for the streetcar once we can get it started? Right. So every mayor uh, inherits the the good things of the past administrations like I did. I had a growing uh, growing city surplus. Uh, I mean, I should say we had money in the bank in terms of our reserves, um, but we we find out every day the the, the Lulus that we inherited. And the, the streetcar is certainly one of them. Um, so our commitment is to making getting the streetcar right and making the, the connections that, that make sense. Uh, so my DDOT director, that was of course uh, among his first charges. Um, uh, when he was appointed. Uh, we brought in an outside review body uh, to peer review the system. Uh, we have a checklist of things that need to be done. Some are small, some are big. Uh, we have to make sure it's safe. We just sent through a package to the council to get the additional spending authority to make those fixes. Um, and then we'll be able to, to get H Street up and running. One of the things that was kind of left out of the plan, you, you saw the write-up recently, was how to make sure we're, you know, we have the heating under the roadway. Um, but the, the fair collection system is kind of a work in progress as well. So there were some big items um, left to us to fix to get um, the streetcar moving. Here's why uh, I'm committed to it. I told you that we we need all modes of travel to work uh, in, in the district. Um, and we've invested already pretty significantly in the 8th Street line. About including $260 million. A lot of millions of dollars. But more than that, uh, a lot of stress on that corridor and stress on those businesses and stress on those residents. And I feel like we're close enough to have it um, operating uh, that, that, that we, that we will get it operating. We need to connect it uh, East and we need to get a more logical co connection to the West. Um, and I look forward to, to having passengers. You service. will ride it during your first administration. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Still to come, we will uh, talk with the mayor about some very big responses to what turned out to be false alarms and we'll take your phone calls. And we are back with Ask the Mayor here on WTOP. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser with us. We are with NBC reporter Tom Sherwood. And, uh, Mayor, just before the break, we uh, mentioned some of the big responses we've had to what turned out to be false alarms. 
It's an impressive response. Yeah. And we still seem to encourage everybody, see something, say something. Yet these responses are very expensive. A couple of more, I thought it might have been a gunshot, but it was just a loud bang, and that could really hurt the city financially. Well, I think what uh, the the chief of police said was in, instructive, that we're always at a heightened sense of alert in, the, in Washington, D.C., and uh, especially uh, from calls from the Navy Yard. I think that we took them very seriously. The Naval Command uh, on, on base took them very seriously. Uh, and you saw a coordinated response. So we we had the the opportunity uh, to see how changes that that we instituted worked. Uh, we had the opportunity uh, prior to uh, a holiday um, to also see how uh, the region would would respond in a more coordinated way. So I'm pleased to say that um, our our first responders, our MPD command, uh, really put in place some changes that were meant to keep us safer. Well, are, you, are you looking at ways to modify the response at first until you determine whether it's a real incident or do you have to respond overwhelmingly? Well, any any credible call um, should have the the response that's needed to keep people safe. And so we're, we're, we're satisfied that that uh, the proper protocol was followed. For many years after 9-11, uh, the media would respond massively ourselves to suspicious packages. Now suspicious packages are almost routine. You hear them several times a week. Police officers go to check them out. Uh, to this date, thank goodness, nothing's happened there. Is there a danger at some point we'll just get to where, well, people heard a gunshot, send somebody to see if there's anything to it, or it would always have to be this massive response? Well, Tom, I will rely on our experts um, to make sure that we have the protocols in place that make sense um, for D.C. Can and you get any federal money back? Well, we're, we're always looking for ways to, to get federal <laughs> money back. And so between our HCMA, our Homeland Security Agency, and our police department, um, they are forward-looking. The reason why I'm so committed to the leadership that we have, that they aren't just planning for public the public safety issues of today, um, but they're looking always looking for in innovative techniques, um, that we're building a hardened, resilient city um, that can be responsive to any type of um, threat, whether it's a natural disaster or it's a, some kind of man-made um, disaster or terror. So our people are always looking for, for ways to keep the city safe. I won't say that, you know, the, the response that's here today is going to be the response that we always use, but I know we have the, the people in place that are looking around the world um, to see how cities are protecting themselves to make sure we have the best responses here in the nation's capital. Going to take a phone call here and you will need the headset to yep. hear the caller, Mayor Bowser. Now let us try right Robert, is that you, Robert? Yes, hello. Hi, yeah, go Robert. ahead. You're on with the mayor. Yes, uh, hello. Hi. I have, I have a bit of, um, I feel, Medicaid fraud, okay, and then what it is in, involved to. I was uh, put in the infirmary at CCNV, okay, that happened after an accident, okay, and then later while gathering information because they stopped my medicine, okay, um, I have the printout from H from Grubbs Pharmacy that Dr. Cardal continued and ordered three sets of my Vicodin. Well, let's be let's be careful now about naming names because these are just uh, we don't know who you are and what your situation have, what's is. What's the question? I have the proof in paper. Okay, that's good. But what your you general say question for the mayor? You want, I got the proof on paper. Good. What's your question so, for the mayor? So I discovered that the doctor had ordered my medicines that would be abused okay. three times. But Bruce, you know what Robert's question, it sounds like um, we've heard accusations like this before. We take them very seriously at our health care finance um, department. Um, we've been diligent in the District of Columbia of making sure that our residents have access to insurance, um, which gives them a primary care doctor, uh, gives them access to the medications that they need, um, and uh, wellness and preventative services as well. Um, so I would ask Robert to make sure he got in touch with us. He can do it easily by dialing 311, um, letting the operator know that he needs a health care finance to investigate um, a doctor who may not be doing the right thing. I would hope you got that. All right. Let's go back to a moment for crime and the police responses. Uh, there's been a spike in, 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 in violence. 
in the city and the region and other cities with synthetic drugs. Um, some people are starting to compare it to the crack cocaine epidemic when there was tremendous violence and tremendous death. Uh, and you've taken steps to allow the police chief to close the stores that sell these synthetic drugs. But what else can be done? And there was that horrible stabbing on Metro outside over there. There's just all these issues where people now feel like we're about to go into a new era of crime increases. Uh, do you sense that fear from the people, and what more are you doing about it? Well, we are taking this uh, synthetic drug rise uh, very seriously. It's not an issue that is particular to Washington, D.C. Um, we think that it's an issue that we're going to see across uh, major cities. Uh, the police chief is being proactive in talking to uh, other law enforcement divisions, talking to the federal government and our federal partners um, to make sure that we can make prosecution stick. Um, but we also want to send a clear message because the, these products were uh, marketed as some harmless thing, even with the names of, you know, children's cartoons on them. So we actually think some of our retailers at first um, didn't know that they were doing something wrong. Um, now we're pretty clear that they know that it's wrong and we want to make our law uh, perfectly clear. If you sell synthetic drugs in the District of Columbia, um, you run the risk of having your business shut down. First strike, you, you get closed for 96 hours and a $10,000 fine. Second strike, $20,000 and closed for 30 days. And our regulatory uh, department will move to, to have your business license uh, revoked. It's serious. It's serious for the person who ingests um, these materials uh, that don't really have the effects of marijuana. Um, they uh, act as a hallucinogen. We see people uh, demonstrate psy the, the psychotic effects uh, even. Uh, so we are concerned about the people who are ingesting it, but we're also concerned generally about public safety of what a person um, under the influence of these drugs uh, might do. One, one thing that may be hurting D.C. more than other cities, though, is that uh, lab delays are blamed for not being able to hold suspects longer because they don't get the information back from the lab in time. D.C. doesn't run its own lab. Could D.C. run its own lab? Well, I think that the, the chief problem is that the chemical makeup of these drugs is easy to change. Um, and the, the, the DEA, I, don't, I won't get the, 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 the schedule of drugs that they're testing for, um, has, to, has to be nimble um, to test with, with it. So uh, that's the discussion among our police department and the, the U.S. attorney to make sure um, that they're actually testing for the materials that they're finding. We're doing some of our own um, research when we have emergency room visits where we think um, these drugs are um, an issue uh, in the emergency rooms testing for these drugs uh, so that the makeup of the drugs, uh, we, we know more real time and can share that information um, with, our, with our prosecutors. We are back after a break with D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser on Ask the Mayor. We are back with Ask the Mayor here on WTOP. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser with us. We are with NBC4 reporter Tom Sherwood today. And let's go to a call now. Sydney, I think we got you back. You're on with the mayor. Go ahead and ask your question. Good morning, Madam Mayor. Um, I uh, Tomorrow will be my 25th year serving in the D.C. Fire Department. And over Excellent. the 25 years, you know, we we run 60 to 70,000 calls a year, but somehow end up being defined by three or four calls that go wrong. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's kind of hurtful when we get beat up in the, in the media. How can the mayor's office, uh, with being a new mayor and having a new chief, uh, help that uh, uh, culture of being beat up or seem like we're not really doing our job? How can we help that go away and really show that we are out there serving and protecting on a daily basis? Well, Sydney, I wish I could control the news, um, but I don't get to do that. But one approach that I've had after eight years in, in public service, I feel that way sometimes, too. Um, so my, our job is just to keep giving them good news. Um, and we, we always can't uh, prevent 
um, bad news. And we know in big cities, uh, certainly what I've learned is difficult situations appear, but we always want to work really hard to give them good news. So the news that we've worked on um, in with regard to our fire and emergency medical service is to make sure that we had excellent leadership at the top. Uh, we recruited a, uh, a fire chief from a city that has been very successful in the areas that we really need to focus on. And that's on how to deal with increasing medical calls uh, to make them faster and, and more effective. And uh, we believe that Chief Dean is going to be that chief. I think the council is going to confirm him today. Um, and we are looking forward to that leadership. We're also committed to making sure that our force has uh, the tools that they need. Uh, we haven't been able to do a good job of keeping uh, track of our vehicles. Uh, the, the technology, the tablets, when I came into office, we had a big problem just with um, making sure that we had reliable tablet connection. We're actually also uh, making sure that we have enough people um, in the district, uh, as in a lot of organizations, we're hitting that baby boom. You just heard my firefighter say that he is 25 years on, which means he can retire. So how are we going to make sure that we are continuing to attract people who want to do the job, want to do it at a high level um, as we approach um, men and women who are who are reaching retirement age? So we have a huge uh, recruitment effort. We have a huge commitment to our cadet program um, and actually implementing the reforms that we have all agreed that are needed. One of the biggest challenges to the fire department right now, just as I said with Metro, is how to address growth. Um, with uh, almost a thousand people moving here, with businesses moving here, with people going to restaurants and businesses and living in places where people haven't lived in decades, uh, we really have to look at how we are um, deploying our resources and dealing with the calls. Um, so just over the, the several months that I've been mayor, we've seen the calls for, me for medical service um, go go through the roof. So we cannot continue to say um, we, we cannot continue to do things the exact same way. And don't you have something like half the city's ambulances out of service on any given day? I beg your pardon. We do not. Uh, we are. I will tell you, Bruce, that uh, one of the things that I have my team tell me every day is how many ambulances we have on the road. Really? Uh, absolutely. And uh, where do we stand today? We're, we're exactly where we should be. Uh, but we're at like 39 out on the road on, on every day. We increased that, I think, by 10 ambulances when I when I came into office just to address it. But what my chief tells me is that that's not the answer, that we're not going to get to, that's not going to match the number of increased calls um, that we have. One, one thing that strikes me when I look at the fire and uh, emergency medical service department is, is that 80 percent of the calls are medical calls. Yet the, the fire trucks run out on, on, on what appear to be medical calls. There's far less fire response. Even with new buildings, they're safer. There's a, they're a lot, frankly, just a lot fewer fires. Does the whole concept of fire and emergency medical service need to be rethought and where there's more of a medical emergency service and the fire department is maybe split off? Or does it all have to be one unit where everyone is trained to fight a fire and save a life? Yes, we, we believe that we, we want all hazards personnel. So fires, medical, um, a major threat that we want Chemical our personnel us, yeah. um, to, to be able to respond to. That doesn't suggest that uh, we, we're not going to add um, some, some avenues for response. Let's take a phone call here again. Lydia calling in from Georgetown. How are you, Lydia? I'm good, thank you. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Lydia. Um, I have a question for you. Um, with the recent stabbings and robberies that have happened on the metro on and around the 4th of July, someone like myself would anticipate there would be more transit police aboard the metro to kind of combat these types of crimes. Um, as a young single female traveling solo on the metro, what can I expect from a safety standpoint to combat these sort of situations that should make me feel comfortable traveling on the metro in the middle of the afternoon, you know, by myself, because it is pretty alarming. I don't recall this many happening this frequently. Good question. Well, that, this is this is what I would say, Lydia. And first, thanks for, for your question. And we want to send um, the message loud and clear that any harm, uh, anyone intending to do harm to Metro staff, Metro passengers, um, 
is going to be dealt with immediately um, in, in, in with a strong response. And so while we had a pretty extraordinary, heinous crime committed on our metro, it is extraordinary um, that we, we have a generally very safe uh, system. Uh, the other the part of our system that, that makes it safe, even on our buses, is that there are cameras um, come for that will capture people coming in the metro, leaving the metro on the platforms at metro. Um, so there is no safe place really to commit a crime where that will go undetected unenforced or unprosecuted. So this, so that's important. And that helps um, with our law enforcement uh, efforts. So I, I know for a fact that Metro won't have the resources to have a, a, a armed police officer on every train, uh, but the, the system is uh, pretty um, well equipped uh, with cameras that, that help with um, crime prevention as well. But are you in touch with the Metro Transit Police Chief as you are with Chief Lanier? Absolutely. Um, Chief Lanier and um, uh, the chief at Metro uh, talk all the time um, about uh, prevention, about big events, um, and if we are involved in investigating any crime on the Metro. And I, I will tell you, even when there was a, a, a attack reported a few weeks ago uh, on the Metro that caught my attention for the very reasons that Lydia mentioned. Um, there was one person attacking another person uh, pretty violently um, that, that was caught on video. Uh, we personally reached out to the, the prosecutor in that case that said it has to be a clear message sent and we're actually looking at some things legislatively too um, that says this type of crime, these are people in confined places, that would be scared and uh, can't uh, readily get away from that incident, that this won't be tolerated on our system. Our system, and people tell me all the time when they visit Washington, because uh, they, they have subway systems that are not clean like ours, um, that, that aren't uh, have new equipment like we do, and aren't safe um, like like ours is. And we d we will not tolerate that that. Um, perception or that reality changing. We are right back with DC Mayor Muriel Bowser. And we are back with Ask the Mayor here on WTOP. DC Mayor Muriel Bowser with us. Bruce Allen here along with NBC reporter, NBC4 reporter Tom Sherwood. Tom? Mayor, a uh, couple of quick questions. The council on Friday had a huge hearing on death with dignity bill to allow a person who's within six months of a terminal de uh, illness death to have two doctors confirm that and then be allowed to self-administer drugs. Do you have any view? I know it's just starting the conversation, but where's your view on that? As well, we, we had um, our Department of Health testify on behalf of the administration just to see how the, the government is implicated in um, in this discussion from delivering death certificates, from our uh, our medical advisory board, from our insurance companies mm -hmm. to, to see how um, they all would be implicated. So we're going to watch it closely. We're going to see how um, other states who have implemented it, um, what, what the response is. This is kind of one of those things that there's the Mayor Muriel Bowser thoughts and that there's Muriel Bowser the person. And, you seem and how personally she, uncomfortable with personally, it. Personally, um, I'm uncomfortable with it. Um, but also personally, I, I, I think to myself, if um, I was in that situation, um, what what would I like to be at my disposal? So I think it's a conversation that's that's worth investigating. My hope is that the, the council takes its time um, and doesn't just kind of adopt what another state has done. Um, look at the peculi peculiarities of the, the District of Columbia um, and what um, our people really want. Very, on this, uh, the council is considering there are some people who want to have a referendum or initiative to make the minimum wage in this city $15 an hour. Uh, your thoughts on that? I know your jobs are one of your big issues, but what about $15 an hour minimum wage? Well, Would jobs you... and uh, closing the income gap is a, a big issue for us. And I will tell you, you asked me, what do I see as the the difference of being a council member and now mayor is that I really can, can see how um, unaffordable the city is becoming and how people who are doing the right things, working hard every day, um, are 
are not able to make ends meet. So I have the opportunity um, when we talk about investing in uh, economic development projects to make sure that every uh, dollar that the city spends on economic development is helping people reach that pathway. Um, I, I had that experience going yes to the no, Marriott Mar Marquee. We, people need to earn more wages. And so the whether it's the, the referendum process, um, I don't know that uh, what the board is going to decide about that. It's kind of an oddity for our referendum process. Um, the voters can't put on the ballot something that would cost the district money. Um, so actually the referendum that they're proposing is that it'll be $15 an hour, but the D.C. government would be exempt. That's kind of a, a okay. odd thing to put to the people. So I think there may be um, different ways to get to it. Um, and Tom, I think it's important, even for us, we're going to be up to 1250 um, in the district uh, by next year. Um, just a few months ago, I was in San Francisco with other mayors who have uh, whose cities have raised the minimum wage. So I think that we have to have a reasonable discussion. Our businesses have not suffered um, because we had a reasonable um, iterated uh, phase in of the minimum wage. And more than that, uh, we worked with our jurisdictional partners in, in uh, Prince George's County and in Montgomery County so that they are on the same schedule we are. So we, we haven't lost uh, a competitive edge business-wise uh, with our neighbors in Maryland. Your thoughts on the uh, big backlash over Donald Trump's comments about Mexican immigrants that led to calls to boycott Trump in D.C.? Well, you know, I am, uh, I've had the experience over the last year of really working with Ivanka Trump on uh, what the vision is uh, for that hotel, which is on our Grand Street, Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, just like uh, so many people that I represent, I just thought Donald's, and though I'm not surprised, uh, we we're just idiotic. And they don't make sense. They don't even stand to reason. And so uh, we're we're very um, disappointed uh, with, with that. We know that the, the hotel itself is kind of in the hands of the federal government, uh, even uh, to the point that the prior administration negotiated an MOU with them to say that the feds would actually issue all of the permits um, that, re that relate to the Trump Hotel. So that's the GSA, uh, the National Park Service, part of the Department Will of the you Interior. Hold an event? He's going to open next year. Will you hold an event there if he hasn't clarified modified or walk back his remarks? I think I am hopeful that he would walk back those remarks. I'm also hopeful that Ivanka will remain the face um, of that of that hotel for, for that corporation. Uh, it, it is important that that hotel is successful. Um, it's going to be a, a big part of the, the revitalization of that part of Pennsylvania Avenue. Once we have the FBI uh, building settled, uh, we know that that will be a huge development. Did you talk to Ivanka after those comments? I haven't I talked to Ivanka recently, but um, I expect that I will at some point. All right. I think we're about out of time. Too bad. we got to get you back for another hour. All right. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thanks, Mayor Bowser, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser. Tom Sherwood, thank you. Thank Good you. to have you here. Thank you. Thank you.